Hello and welcome everybody to today's session. Um, thanks so much for joining us on a Friday afternoon. We're going to make this as much fun as possible so that we really do live up to the Thank God It's Friday hashtag that I just put up there in the chat window. So today's topic is about personalization. So there was a time, you know, a few years ago when I used to hesitate when someone asked me for you know, in a restaurant, they would be like, fill up this form, give me your email ID and your phone number. And I really hesitated to do that because I really thought they were going to, you know, call me and send me all kinds of offers. I now realize that this is actually no problem at all because most of the time what happens is that they take all this data and then nothing happens. So actually you could give your data with confidence. And that's really the heart of it, right? So today we all have access to so much of information um, about our customers, about our prospects. And when they give that information to us, they have these expectations of what we as brand owners and custodians are going to do with it. But most of the time we are struggling saying that, you know, there's this whole ocean of data. I mean, you've heard of words like data lake, actually it's a whole ocean of data. And it's hard for us to figure out what to do that is relevant to the customers with all of this. Because the fact is that most of us do not have products or services that are customizable to the degree of uniqueness that it's individual to a user. And so it's hard to figure out that we know that this person likes us or we know this person lives there. Um, how do we use it meaningfully to create a unique experience for them? And um, to explore this topic, we're really privileged to have with us Umatal Dreja, who's a Chief Digital Officer for Raymond, and also Antonia Edmonds, who's the head of IBM Watson Marketing for Asia Pacific. And um, today's session is co-hosted with IBM, and we're really going to cover it, the topic from two aspects. So one is how do we use our customer understanding to create a unique personalized experience? And the second is how do we use technology to enable this personalization and experience for our customers? So I'm going to hand over now to Umatul Reja, who's our first speaker. And uh, most of you are familiar with her work. She has worked with a number of consumer brands. Um, but is currently with Raymond. She was earlier with a Westside and um, she's worked with Burger King as well. So she brings a lot of consumer insights into this. So over to you, Uma. Great. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Thanks a lot, Jesse, for that and setting the context. Uh, I'm using Zoom the first time, so I'm a little clumsy with this right now but can you see me and hear me and do i add my screen now or are you good with that okay so um let me just start with uh, you know uh, a few views that i have and uh, having been in marketing for very long i think all of us have seen how marketing has evolved over a period of time and it has become extremely difficult for us to actually deal with a complex ecosystem of marketing channels marketing tools and you know how insight has actually broken into such narrow components right and what is this that we can do to exploit you know current consumer behavior i think one one thing that you know i have learned throughout the stream of working especially on retail is that the closer you are to the customer the more successful your marketing is and I think that's a big challenge of brands like CPG, for example, who don't have that advantage and have to lean on various sources of data. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to share some experiences of mine, which maybe people can leverage and correlate back to you know, their own industries and their own priorities and see if it makes sense to apply that. And how do you simplify this whole complexity of personalization? There's a lot of talk about one-to-one -one marketing. What does it really mean? And what do customers actually, you know, want from it? I think that's really what we want. So I'm going to share my screen, uh, my presentation. Okay. Uh, can you confirm that you can see this? Yes, so now we can see your slide okay. screen. We can also see you on the video. Okay, fine. So, okay. So I'm just going to talk about this in terms of, you know, when it is personalization. And it's interesting because... 
recently you know in a lot of uh, different forums a lot of cmos have been talking about this saying that what really is personalization and how do you know you've got it right and i think one of the biggest uh, you know um, insights for me or other impact moments for me is that personalization while we talk about it as a marketing tool it's not necessarily only communication and your campaigns are achieve personalization in fact when personalization is really done right it doesn't feel like marketing i think that's the most important thing so as a retailer what has always been important to me is that if it is personal am i able to actually deliver my promise right when the customer feels that it has been done right for him and the service has been delivered i think it makes a huge difference and he feels yes that personally he has been satisfied and i think that's important because very often we are caught up in click through rates and video view rates and saying that you know have we done that job yes content is very important but it has a role to play and how do we actually build the journey to personalization such that the customer is less feeling special is less feeling cared for is important so hotels if somebody is from hospitality will know my pillow preference in a hotel room right is is really personalization though it's not my personal pillow it's still the hotel's pillow so how do you create moments like that i think which actually add to the personal flavor of the relationship between you and your brand is important and, and you know i remember when i was at more at aditya birla retail i think for me it was very important to make sure i bundle the right flavors of noodles for example the right aromas and fragrances of soap for example right which is important to the customer how do you identify preferences and then create those flexible bundles but that's not just merely about a promotion design it's really about the the preference of that customer what have you learned from them and then you know created that which is actually meant for them because you've learned about them yeah the second thing i think is that you know the question that we often ask is that how am i going to serve one customer at a time and how is this really going to be unique right but i don't think while all of us are unique in our own way i think in personalization a segment of one means a lot of context which is actually more real time and channel etc but segments still play a very very important role and i think what's important getting right in personalization is not necessarily whether the solution is unique but is it relevant to me as an individual right because you've understood my behavior and preferences right and it makes me feel unique i think that's that's what we have to aim for so for example if i'm walking into an itc hotel today right the biggest moment for me as a woman is that i know there are women's products which are kept in that hotel for room for me and it's personalized it may not be my favorite brand but the but the hotel has understood that there's a difference between two guests and that expectation might be different right uh, when you know that your birthday is known to your service provider similarly and other examples like that i think it's important right when someone wishes you but how deep can you go is where your content can actually play a role right so how how well you do the job of course also comes but catching the moments that come uh, are very very important and i'll give you a very good example i had recently some time back bought a cartier watch from the one of the dealers here and i'm treated now as a person you know with fine taste and i think that's also to me so it's not about you recommending many more watches to me of course i might want to explore but that's not personal that's you trying to sell me something that you have understood i have the potential to buy right so you're not selling me other cheaper watches because that's what address of you know what is my propensity to spend but really when you treat me as a person with fine taste and you call me for the launches i can see what's new what is the new design that other brands are actually bringing in right and i get to enjoy that whole experience and indulge my passion right for for design and for a fine lifestyle and for watches is when i feel that it has been done personally and i think that's really the difference between doing what is relevant and making you feel unique i think that's the take away that as a marketer i would want to always aim for yeah so what is really and how do you get to the aha moment right i think that is very very important and there are many use cases here which i'm using which help you to make it easy and you can apply it to your own category and industry so all of us go to hotels which is why i've taken a lot of hotel examples is very easy to actually correlate to that we know that when we get there late in the night sometimes to check in after a flight or we know we've come there after a meeting or a long day to work and when it takes very long to check in 
right? It's it's actually a pain point. It is a pain point. And then hotels have actually gone therefore and build personalization with a room check-in option. So is it unique to me? No, it's not unique to me, but it's very very relevant. It's still very very personal, right? Emotive pay is very very high, and something like that you can check over a period of time through a customer lifetime value to see how much retention you can gain through through interventions you know of of this sort but on the flip side if i have bought a shirt and you are giving me a recommendation for a complimentary uh, trouser frankly no that's not personalization and i think a lot of us get caught up in this whole thing saying i'm building a recommendation engine what is that recommendation really going to do what is that attribute which is personal versus sales i think sales promotion and personalization have to be separated uh well enough for you to actually get to personalization your sales promotion may ride the back of that but if you are telling me that i bought a shirt and i am going to get a complimentary trouser that sales there's a cross sell it's not actually personalization right if somebody else bought that you would also do that because you're completing the look you're giving advice of what is the best way to consume that product it's not based necessarily on my preference of whatever i bought and you are not recommending me new varieties for example my size or my odd size which is not available anywhere that's first yeah the other the other few examples i had which again we know so for example <clears throat> this is the real instance when i was at shopper store and um, we had a store at uh, you know um, uh, andheri and uh, customer who was actually staying in a hotel very close to the store who checked in in the night right and airline had actually delayed his baggage and when the airline had delayed his baggage uh, our our store manager actually used to visit that hotel for for dinner and for coffee a lot store manager called right uh, the sorry the, the hotel manager called the store manager thing i have this problem i have this guest actually this guest in fact you even asked the hotel because he had he was in dire straits saying can you lend me clothes from the laundry you know no hotel has a right to give somebody else's clothes from the laundry so he called shop stop and he said this can you do something so the next morning usually the store opens at 11 the store opened for the this customer at 8 o'clock now that's very 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 unique right What it is you? extremely uh, looking at the customers pain pain yeah, problem yeah. this story has been told i don't know by how many times uh, you know how many times by customers yeah. and the yeah. word of mouth or virality of a, such a story is very very yeah. high the cost yeah. is very very low yeah. but sometimes to make things like that like that yeah. happen yeah. i think yeah. what is also important is that you have to allow your staff to break rules for being customer centric right because we are all bound by sops and we are all bound by policies right when you want to really deliver an exceptional experience it is important that you are able to empower your staff to take that mature leap of faith in terms of what's really good for the customer and for the brand i think that's really very important now another example recently and this is again from our own business at raven and uh, we had launched our e-commerce uh, you know website last year just before diwali it was actually just before diwali so we had a lot of fulfillment issues and there was uh, somebody who our operations were new and somebody had ordered a bangla for his father as a diwali gift from one city to another city and uh, well we weren't uh, good at it and uh, getting it there in time and this person didn't actually reach out to a customer service cell but obviously was very uh, you know pissed off and upset and decided to actually rant on twitter and uh, we caught that because we are monitoring that so we caught that right and my fulfillment team who works with me actually located a similar option you know very close store right and delivered it overnight right so real time response is very very important being able to understand uh, you know when you want to make sure you do respect you know what you have done to disappoint a customer and then go out of your way if if there is a especially i think over here it is very important to understand that customers have a context in terms of what is the level of disappointment and really what is fair right i think fair compensation is a very important concept in personalization especially when you when you want to look at a cx opportunity right saying that there is something that is going wrong and what would be the fair response and fair response and the fair uh, action in personalization and in even service and service recovery like that is not an equation between 
what your cost of service was and have you compensated that and i, I remember you know very often and in my, in my past uh, you know career we i've seen examples where if you've gone wrong on something you offer an equivalent refund but i think personalization takes a little more than that personalization takes understanding that customer and looking at saying that how will that opportunity be used to make create real delight right and if there is high level of disappointment there needs to be high level of uh, your fulfillment of your core promise and how you go out of the way to deliver it as well brand protection is also very very important and therefore you have you have instances like this and opportunities like this which you are if you be able to track and deliver you can be extremely close to your customer's heart yeah few other things so for example lot of us use search you know as a context and uh, i think we have to be careful how we actually contextualize to search it's very easy uh, to give in to what you have seen and to serve you know your ad but if you want to actually build meaningful conversation and that's what what personalization should be that where you want customers to engage back with you because they have appreciated what you had to say uh, and what you had to offer i think you have to be uh, very uh, good with that and i'm going to give you this uh, this is actually a example from the oberoi in gurgaon right so i've i've used pollution risk because that's the biggest topic right now but at that time i think there was some there was was very cold if i remember in uh, in delhi and this is what really happened when i booked, when i landed in delhi where the concierge actually contacted me saying that do you want a meeting room because it's really cold right and you want to hold your meetings in the hotel instead and we are offering it to a few select you no know, customers very very relevant and is this even a cost right because a lot of corporate travelers have the luxury of doing you know and availing service but probably don't think of it you know don't really think of it uh, most meeting rooms which are small board rooms in hotels are actually unoccupied very very often right and the hotel has capitalized this optionally i did use it i did actually use the the service offered by the you know hotel another camping that we did which has been very successful for us in fact is again during winter where people who were checking for weather in cold locations we offered express delivery of new sweaters that raymond had just launched and you know we also said that you if you don't like it you can return it it's not that it was not an exception we do of course accept returns even otherwise but we used the context of search and we made sure that our promise was well well understood and i think a lot of people told us it was a very sweet thing in terms of an idea so yes this was a sales campaign of course it is contextualized and um, one could say that what is so personal about it i think it's the impact that one gets out of something like that saying that it's a cool idea you know you are offering me sweaters it's too cold to go out and shop it's going to come home to me overnight and i'm going to actually return it if i don't like it and i think that work to you know get us very good uh, customer feedback on people who actually avail the service and otherwise also is a talkable and great value in such things you can also measure awareness of course because it's important to measure uh, in many ways in many different ways but i think that one measure does not suit everything and in this case i think i was trying to push sweaters so yes i did want to check if people knew whether raymen has sweaters where people are aware that they have launched sweaters how did the sales actually do did i get conversions on this campaign etc very often i think personalization doesn't deliver large scale you know results as well and that's fine i think building lots of micro opportunities like that which create a cumulative effect on your relationship with your customer is very very important as well so really if i have to see how is it that you know you build build this and i i know that we are going to talk about technology and how we can automate later so i'm just going to talk about saying that how is it that you can actually build personalization so of course there is this whole piece of the customer profile and segments and you build campaigns you have hyper localization and real time which is important and you could build campaigns right you also have search browsing behavior you're using cookie ids or you're doing that right now you build campaigns right there's history preferences in your building campaigns around personal recommendation and predictive and prescriptive modeling however really personalization is a complex web which includes many of these in journeys that you cannot really predict predict any more and i think that's the difference right so we had a very linear funnel on marketing earlier it's at awareness interest desire action advocacy etc but that's not what is happening today 
the way consumers and their part to purchase of how they land on your brand is complex which is why personalization is far more complex today because you have to learn to connect multiple dots across the grid at multiple points in time in multiple ways right and that is what makes uh, personalization yeah. complex and that is where technology can really really help right okay. so how do you really make it happen so i think the first level is still about the data so where you have to collect a lot of data you have to collect rich data which is around who your customer is collect their preferences you have to collect location data you have to collect channel preference data so it is very important that you are making sure you have tools to capture data to validate data and to store and correctly uh, you know tabulate your data and be making it useful but what is important beyond that i think is the insight and that there is a traditional marketing wisdom is very very important knowing what matters to your customer is very very important and i'll give you a very simple example right so if i build a lot of data in apparel and most of the recommendation engines today actually recommend you more of the same right or what people like you have bought um i'm going to present a little controversial view around that because according to me that's not recommendation that's filtering and there are still curating a catalog on two variables that's really what is happening right because i know that you have bought a certain type of color in a style i'm pegging you on that preference right and the first thing that is wrong about this is that 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 when i'm buying fashion i'm exploring right i want to do more i want to discover more even about myself right that's one but where will personalization and what attribute will really matter is what is the insight so insight is that yes i want to explore i want to look good i want to do to do my best right and i want that best which is out there it's not about more of the same and i don't want to look like someone else who looks like me so it is it is actually if you see most of these uh, you know uh, recommendation platforms give you very low conversions the conversion that it is giving you is giving you conversion because you're filtering the catalog better that is all what we are actually achieving today and insight is extremely extremely important and that is why if i just go back and say that that pillow that pillow is the insight of a great peaceful sleep that lo- similar to what i get at home right which is why that pillow it, it matters right and maybe something else doesn't so in in the same case if i had to take fashion probably color does not matter but my measurements and my fit right and my size does matter because that is what creates that satisfaction basis which i can guarantee something to the you know customer the third thing is also important of course then to build all of this into some very strong analytic capabilities here what i've learned is it's good to actually have four or five initiatives right under which you want to cluster things which are of strategic importance so for example in our case we have one full area which operates around propensity and prescriptive analytics which is based on the past data which is mostly based on efficiency and making sure that you know we are nat- tracking our customers visits and we are managing our cost i think we use that the best over there in terms of better targeting right but then we look at segmentation as a very important lever in terms of actually tracking longevity of that relationship and where that segment lies and how that behavior is moving more than treating customers as segments so if i know that there is a particular characteristic of a segment and there's a gap from another segment how do i move people up and see whether i have a longevity of distribution and migration in that segment which i can track over a period of time so that's the other thing that we have been uh, doing uh, fairly successful the well in times of uh, terms of actually increasing the usage of the brand you know by customers across by moving them up the ladder i think that's the second thing that we do and the third thing is important i think for most of us is because brand loyalty is such a fallacy today churn management is very very important i think that's the other piece that we have looked at and the fourth is an interesting way that we have built our basket analysis so yes there is a lot of data science behind it but what we have done is build an actual a uh, behavior layer of how customers actually shop right um, the the usual tendency of analytic companies especially and people who work with the tools etc and you want to create a simplistic model and you want to make a model which makes sense of course but what tends to happen is that we tend to ignore actual consumer insight in that in that model so for example when people go shopping 
people tend to say you know in your wardrobe there shirts trousers jackets etc and you know you have you have t-shirts and you may have one trouser or whatever it may be right now that's of course the composition of the basket but that's not how people shop people shop by need people shop by occasion people shop by impulse and that is what we have used to actually incorporate into the market basket model so that so that our recommendation can be a little more meaningful than saying yes you bought a pink shirt so i'm going to sell you another pink shirt right and i think that doesn't really necessarily take the customers forward in any way um the the other pieces i think what is very very important is be clear about the proposition right what is it that you are actually offering to that customer if it's a promotion it's a promotion if it's an if it's an engagement campaign and what do you have to say what is it that is going to make a difference customers are not responding only because of your data and because you have looked at your channel if they are responding because you have been able to marry what they need to you know what what you offer but also to what's going on around them right and that proposition has to be very very clear and compelling for people to respond otherwise no personalization doesn't really deliver just like that i think that's the second the third is prepare for content because the minute you actually want to do this right and you know that you are going to actually capitalize on that kind of data the number of content pieces that you will need which are also riding on the back of propositions is very very high and i think that's a core capability which you know today in today's time we need which is this whole explosion of content at very micro levels may not have too many differences but needs to have clear meaning to people and it needs to be served in a very agile manner it needs to be served to format uh, you know preference um, and to social and digital adaptation well and it should be mobile responsive you need to prepare for all those things and i think very important for those people especially who are in in service uh, you know uh, delivery um, formats very very important to actually align your people to what you are trying to achieve i found that you know if our store staff is aligned to the larger purpose they deliver the best if our store staff's uh, uh, kpis are aligned of course they also deliver incentivization also works but the rallying cry that we achieve and the customer delight we achieve and the purpose of what we are trying to achieve and the higher order of that purpose of customer centricity is understood by that last mile person who's actually delivering it it works best and that's where we see a huge difference between what happens at our call center and what happens at our at our at our uh, you know store so when you're building a program like that you need to stitch it through end and end to end and create clear understanding of what you're trying to actually do and what you're trying to actually deliver and measure right it's also very easy to of course get lost in you know data and uh, i think over uh, the last 20 years i have loved working with you know customer data but what i've learned in retail is that you know it's great to be data savvy but it's very important to balance that by being customer sensitive and sensitive to customer needs versus being blindly data driven right and i think we see enough of that uh, as consumers ourselves as well when you know that you have finished booking and you have gone to a booking.com site and you know you have gone after that to hotels.com and you may have gone to agoda etc you may have already booked somewhere else but the booking portal keeps actually showing you the browse hotel or a e-commerce portal keeps chasing you that product i think somewhere we have to measure the latency at which stage actually you know a what is it at which stage do people actually book how do we use some predictive modeling to say when do we really stop right i think that's that's one of the things i think i've also seen that times you know your you buy a gift for someone is conf- confused with your usage and product affinities that get formed are correlated in a confused manner instead of looking at cause and effect and i think that also you know is one of the use cases which i think are very prominent in terms of how things are treated in terms of recommendations to you know people um few more things that happen we assume relationships which don't exist right we use wrong attributes to make a profile which are not necessarily important to the customer in terms of them describing themselves right and then so also as a consequent or very often your look alike modeling goes wrong as well right and this we see executed also in, in ways which you know turns people off not everybody wants to be followed by an ad on you know um, digital and i think uh, there has to be a balance and therefore aggressive pop ups is remarketing that haunts you sometimes there's very creepy interference around location especially if you find etc and like i said correlation is actually confused with causation and that leads to very ir- inaccurate and irrelevant attributes that get used 
right? And therefore, you get recommendations which obviously make no sense. You know, and after some time, people stop clicking on your advertising. And I think that's important to keep in mind when we are building this. Now, what I say to my team always is that, you know, we are very fortunate that we are marketers of products that we consume. And um, it helps to apply, you know, your own hypothesis first in, in building this. And and that, that pays off very, very often. I'm going to give this class. As a case, I'm sure everybody knows as to, you know, when data being data driven can actually be very, uh, you know, encroach on your privacy and not necessarily feel that good. So that's the target case where the father learned that his teenage daughter was pregnant because Target started sending a diaper coupons and they had actually used a whole model. They were right, uh, as it turns out later that they were lied. But this is this is where you don't necessarily respect this marketing because it's the last thing. It's not Target's job to tell this father firstly. Right, it's just not. So you've not, they've not understood that the same laptop is being used by multiple people. They've not understood that the same account is being used by multiple people. They're mistaken. Obviously, their adjacencies in the back of that, right, and seeing what is really going on. And then they have done this, and they've got it right, right. So I'm sure that you know someone in Target, uh, Target was have really been very proud of this discovery that they made. But it's not good marketing. Right, because it's a painful or it could be a funny story today, but I don't think this family really necessarily had, uh, you know, a good time actually sharing this experience, uh, you know, that Target put them through. Right, so I think the last thing that I would say here is therefore, I know why be careful of what you communicate, right? Be careful that you don't get trapped in this huge chase for personalization that you also enter spam. Um, we are in an era where it's very easy for customers to opt out. If you cannot contact your customer and you cannot recognize your customer, it's a lost customer in your measurement. Be aware of that because you can't use this customer's data to influence that customer or even talk to that customer anymore. And I think these are a few examples of what I have been getting. And you know, my response to these campaigns is, is I'm sure what, what as it would be yours, right? So I get a campaign from Swiggy very, very often asking me to become your delivery boy, right? Um, I'm a customer. I don't think I've ever done delivery for anybody. So I don't know why I gave this campaign. And actually, I don't feel like using Swiggy because it's really hilarious that this is how they actually, and it makes me wonder whether I will get my order in time sometimes as well, if this is how they actually track their data. Um, I keep getting an ad, uh, you know, from, um, I think it's uh, the, it's a chain where most corporates actually have their health, uh, you know, checkup saying last day for full body checkup at a specific price. But it's being sent to me every day as the last day. So when really is the last day? I think you lose seriousness with things like that, right? Because people think that, you know, you're constantly actually crying wolf with them. And that's not what you want to do to your customers as well. And we have many examples of campaigns where because you try to create a false sense of urgency, how later you stop getting response. And this one, I think, is really beautiful. 100 reward points credit to my account for one week. 100 reward points is 100 rupees. The cap fare for me to get to uh, is 700 rupees from my house. The offer given to me is 100 rupees. My last shopping and bill value with this retailer particularly was 12,000 rupees. I'm not going to respond to this campaign. If I do come back and I do come back later, I think the cause and effect this retailer will build saying that it is because of this 100 reward points in the past. I remember to come back to your, I think that's where we go wrong. Yeah, but I don't think I'm coming right for a campaign like this. And I think if people have responded to a campaign like this, and this is what the data is in the back, it's a coincidence and it's a cannibalized response. People are coming because they were any way going to be, you know, uh, coming. I think one of the things you also did is to prevent things like that. One of course is to look at our RFM segments, look at propensity, etc. But we also have control groups, and we clearly measure the difference between campaign responders and non-campaign responders currently, just as a efficiency and a uh, lever to see whether our campaigns are really moving in the right direction. I think that has helped uh, while control group is a limited way to understand it, but it's a good way to actually make sure to, you know, uh, look at how you are um, uh, performing on your campaigns and whether, yes, you seem to be in the good boundaries of what people uh, want from you and your campaigns are working and you're getting an incremental lift and it's not actually reaching to the converted. I think that's important as well. I think, um, yeah. My last point on this is, yes, there's a, there's a lot that can go wrong, but you need not you know, be afraid to try. Uh, I think uh, what I have learned is it's good to identify what good looks like first and focus on that, right? Set up a few experiments, learn before you actually 
automate and build scale. So I think you do that to actually choose your tool and customize all your functionalities within that. And that's important and it works. Um, it's expensive technology. Uh, most of us, they have very large data, but there are many of us who don't have very large data as well. Yet you want to be personal and the technology may come in your way. This is a good way to actually assess what you need, right? The second is you, once you create, use your, your creative scope and your requirements, you have to focus equally on the content. I think there we go wrong because we do a lot of personalization and then we serve a lot of the similar content. I think, and it's also not necessarily very meaningful from a personal perspective. I think that's very important to build that capability. And the third is plan for, you know, the growing scale. So don't think that, you know, what is good today will be good for you tomorrow. So plan for a scale, which is actually, you know, growing and empower your staff. Create buy-in across your service delivery, create buy-in across your cam, uh, you know, call center, your retail, your operations teams, etc. Make sure you empower them to be able to deliver with customer response at that point in time to your campaign because people respond in multiple channels in multiple ways. Empower them with enough information that they can actually go back and talk to customers as well. And I think that's important to stitch it up from a human element and that makes a huge difference to how people feel about what you have offered to them as well. And that, that is an important thing, though, you know, we are all in a digital world you know, today. I think that's, that's, that's all for me today. And uh, happy to take uh, any questions or Jesse, I'm not sure if you're out of time. <laughs> yeah, so thank you so much. And that was actually really interesting. Um, what I'm going to do is the, there are questions for you actually on the chat window. So I'm going to ask yeah. you if you could take them on chat itself yeah. and, um, you know, hand over the floor to Antonia right now. If that's okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah, sure. I can do that. Yeah. And could you yeah. just make uh, Pearl Writer as host again? I, yeah. Just one second. Great. So um, if you could put your chat window open and just, you know, see what the questions were. And yeah. uh, if you could just reply on chat itself, that would be great. Yeah. And yeah. Um, now we have Antonio. Great. Antonio has just started screen sharing and I can see her screen. Can you great. hear me? So Antonio, over to you. Yes, we can hear you. I don't know that we you can, can hear you. You can hear me. Okay, fantastic. All right. And you can see my screen. Great. Well, thank you very much for That's having right. me on today. And thank you, Uma, for your insightful um, uh, tips there earlier. I'm going to add a bit more context and give you some um, customer examples. Um, so uh, bear with me. So um, the reality is, is that we're all short of time. Um, we're all being bombarded with messages all the time, it, whether it's in our inboxes, whether it's by SMS, whether it's just in the you know, advertising messages that we're seeing. And it's not, as brands, it's not just your competitive messages that you're competing for. You're also competing um, against every one of your customers or your recipients, mm -hmm. you know, their other environment, their friends, yeah. their family. You're competing against the uh, Kardashians or, or the Khans, mm -hmm. perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, you're competing against news and things that are happening in their environment. So it's incredibly important that um, you, we look for new tactics to be able to uh, you know, cut through the clutter um, and the noise and get people you know, excited and engaged uh, with your brand. Um, and there is a way to get people's attention. And I think that sometimes as marketers, um, we you know, use the excuse that, um, oh, well, our customers are too busy. That's why our response rates are low. We'll just send another message or we'll go every day because then at some point they'll, they'll respond. But that's not working anymore. What does work is if you can show relevance, that you can be engaging. Um, and, you know, and, and the best place to start by being re relevant, I would argue, is through personalization. Um, and the data is there to support it. This was a study conducted by the Harvard Business Review. And they said that personalization can reduce acquisition costs by as much as 50%. It can also lift revenue by between 5 and 15%. And it can increase marketing spend efficiency by 10 to 30%. Now, these are all stats that I know any marketer, uh, you know, results that any marketer would be happy with. 
Um, and the great thing about it is not only is this good for, for business, it's also what customers want. Um, and I think, you know, we are in an age where customer experience has become the new battleground, um, where customers are increasingly demanding and their expectations are higher than ever before. And, you know, these studies, um, we, there have been a number of studies um, that also, you know, speak to this. So we see here that three quarters of consumers are more likely to buy from a retailer that personalizes. 72% um, of consumers are willing to share personal data with a brand that they trust. And um, to Jesse's point earlier, I find it depressing that we think we can give personal information because no one's going to do anything with it. I think if we're you know, asking for information um, from our customers, we should be doing them the courtesy of using that to be more relevant and more engaging in return. Um, and the more that we do that, the more that consumers will trust the brand and the more information you'll get in return. And finally, 74% of customers feel frustrated when website content is not personalized. So the stakes are pretty high. You may have heard this uh, expression before, um, customer expectations are liquid. I think this was coined by Accenture and um, some smart people there. Um, and what this really means is that you know, your customers' expectations are being shaped by their last best experience, which means that, you know, if they have a great experience in a completely unrelated brand, that becomes the new norm, the new norm by which they expect every interaction with every other brand to be. So this means that, you know, even if you're not personalizing or customizing or creating an engaging individual experience, others are. And we see that from some of the sort of leading brands that are um, you know, doing extremely clever things. You see that with you know, some of the big um, sports brands, you know, Adidas is a good example of their multi-channel stores. You see sort of online um, providers doing a similar job. You know, Amazon's a global example. And that becomes then the benchmark and they are measuring you against that benchmark. And you have to be honest with yourself in terms of how are you performing. Personalization then becomes both an offensive tactic and a defensive one. Offensive in the sense that you, know, you are going out to provide a superior customer experience, knowing that customers who feel that they are being treated as an individual are more likely to respond, to engage, um, and to be more loyal. It's also defensive as you, you know, protect yourself from um, customers leaving. And, you know, we know this to be true. Customers who do not feel like they are being treated, um, you know, as an individual by, a, uh, you know, or that the brand doesn't show that they know them, you know, are both vocal and active. Customer disloyalty, and we heard this earlier, is at an all-time high. It's very easy for customers to switch. It's a click of a mouth. Um, and so, you know, Protecting your base, protecting your brand um, is a key, you know, a key part of this as well. Unfortunately, we also know that personalization isn't necessarily easy. It takes many forms. It can easily be done wrong um, and it can get complicated. Um, it all, you know, as I think, um, I think it was Uma who said earlier, um, and Jesse too, you know, the best personalization feels like magic. It really feels like you're being treated as an individual, that the brand knows you, they value you, um, and that even if you're not yet a customer, that they still understand, you know, your likes, your preferences. Um, and it shouldn't be creepy. It shouldn't be, hey, we know that you visited our website six days in the last, uh, six times in the last two days, and why have you still not bought? You know, it's, it's much more subtle than that. It should feel much more engaging than that. Um, the answer, of course, and we heard this as well earlier, is that it's about data. It's data-driven marketing. But this in itself can also present a challenge um, because in many cases, data is fragmented across, you know, fits in multiple base spaces, in multiple silos across an organization. And I'm sure that many of you are using multiple tools and systems to try to manage your data. You may have an email tool. You may have a separate you know, mobile database which push where push messages are going out from. You, know, you may be tracking your website data by, via cookies, and that's in a different web, uh, you know, database. Um, equally, you might have a, you know, an, a sort of you know, 
legacy data warehouse over there and IT may be the ones that are broadly responsible for that data. So it's hard to access it. It's hard to access it in you know, a quick enough time period for it to still be relevant and meaningful. Um, and so I think you know, the, core, the core recommendation is around you know, getting a, a handle of your data and making sure that you're connecting that into a single database so that you can make use of that as marketers in more real time. Um, because what it this comes down to is you have to, as marketers, address the challenge of how do you know who a customer is ev everywhere that they are interacting with you as the brand. You know, they may look to you as an email address over there, but it could be an app, uh, you know, an IMEI number or a you know, mobile phone number or a cookie. How do you connect those dots and make sure that you know that the person who came to your website yesterday is the same person who was recently uh, logging into your app? who is perhaps even the person who came into store. Um, because you know, those lines between online and offline are also blurring for consumers. And how is, do we as marketers address that? Again, that can, be, that can be challenging. But until we do that, it's not possible to you know, be relevant wherever they're interacting. And I think that, you know, of course, we've all heard the, you know, the adage of right message, right person, right time. But I think customers are moving beyond that. And it's really about the right experience to the right person at a time that is right for them. And that should be what we're all aiming for. I'm gonna give you a couple of um, uh, quick examples um, of uh, organizations um, that are working with IBM um, and how they've achieved this. So I'm just gonna go through um, a couple here. So firstly, um, this is a well-known mid-sized bank um, in India, and they've been working with us um, since um, 2016 when they started to relook at um, how they were managing their data and how they were targeting their customers across their multiple lines of business in uh, both retail banking and personal finance. And you know what they did is they consolidated um, a lot of this um, uh, data and then used some real-time analytics to better understand um, you know, who their customers were, who were the most likely to purchase certain kinds of products. Um, they used predictive modeling. Um, and other cognitive kind of machine learning there to, to get better insights into their data. And then they connected that with the campaign automation tool um, so that they could automate campaigns to those segments. Um, and you, know, you see some of the results here on the right-hand side. It didn't take a lot, a lot of time for them to start seeing some uh, you know, huge benefits, really. They over-exceeded their, um, they exceeded their um, uh, revenue target um, uh, in the first four months um, against the six-month target. Um, they, you know, have been able to implement, you know, a significant number because, of course, once you're using automation, um, you can, you know, scale up quite quickly. Um, you can also see that, you know, from a response rate perspective, you know, today that's doubled uh, or more than doubled from just over 8% to 19.5% and their click rate from 0.2% to 0.58%. And I think there's still some, you know, some ways to go there too. Other impacts have been an improvement in, you know, deliverability rates. They're getting fewer hard and soft bounces. They're getting generally better engagement and lower churn rates because people are more engaged. They're getting more relevant content for them. Uh, I'll, the next example is Shutterfly. You may or may not be familiar with them, but they're a pretty large um, uh, North American-based um, sort of personal gift and photo company. So you can upload your photos and then print them, either with you know, prints or in photo books or on uh, mugs and cups, etc. cetera. Um, and um, you know, they, they had an email program for, an, for a you know, number of years, and they had some pretty strong open rates. They were quite happy with those, um, you know, in excess of 20%. But... And their problem was really around conversions. They had a high number of you know, opens, but lower conversions. And so they chose to just, uh, just um, change how they were targeting um, their customers. And so what they did is they started to look at more behavioral data. They looked at you know, the past purchase history, what people had purchased previously, um, and you know, as well as the more immediate um, behavioral data. So their browsing history, they connected it with their web analytics. And so we're able to um, you know, look at people, what they were looking at on the website, whether they'd abandoned a basket. And then they triggered campaigns uh, based on that data. So uh, not only was it personalized with the you know, known customer information, but also the content in there was personalized with products that they'd browsed or products previously purchased or that they'd abandoned on the site. 
Um, so they, you know, they move really from a sort of segmentation model, which meant, you know, let, where, which is product centric fundamentally, where, you know, you're saying, I have this product, I need to, you know, find a group of customers who want to buy it, you know, and then press send, to, same to everybody, rinse and repeat. And they move this to more of an individually, behaviorally triggered communication stream, personalized as much as possible with the relevant content. Um, one of the other, what you'll see there on the lower right-hand corner, can, if you can see those images. So, you know, they did some quite cool things. That's an image from one of their um, email campaigns. And that's, in fact, their, one of their popular gift cards, um, sort of holiday, uh, you know, cards that they have. And, you know, in the email, they didn't, it, it was that picture um, in there is actually taken from one of the previous purchases for existing customers. So if I received that email, it would look like, you know, standard promotion for their holiday um, uh, gift cards. Um, but in fact, it was the, the image in there would be a photo that I had previously uploaded and previously used for a product. So it's cleverly, subtly personalized entirely to me. Um, and they've seen some, you know, significant um, increases in response uh, rates and engagement uh, levels there too. Um, and finally, and I know somebody asked this on the chat group earlier, um, Zuma Media is a group of um, Canadian publications, um, and it's targeted, they have about 15 million, um, you know, uh, regular readers, subscribers, um, uh, for, and it's mainly for sort of age group of 45 and over. And um, they wanted to engage more with their readership by providing, um, you know, better and more relevant content. Um, they also have a, a longer term goal or you know, mid term goal of transitioning more to digital uh, media um, from their sort of offline readership because, of course, there's greater opportunities to engage and provide more um, personalized content at an individual level on those channels. Um, and so, again, you know, they, they looked at you know, insights on their digital assets. They looked very closely at how people were engaging on the site and trying to map that back to their existing customer database so they could see you know what people were most likely to read how they navigated through the site where they perhaps um, dropped off and they'd categorize their content and their images so they could see you know the types of content that people are looking at and then you know they use that to personalize not just the you know their emails and their communications their newsletters um, which are then you know uh, uh, where the stories are then prioritized based on that person's previous browsing history, um, but actually they're also using that to personalize the inbound experience. So, you know, for people coming straight to the website, you can personalize it with previous browsing behavior, and you can do that for anonymous people too. Um, and, you know, the goal being that eventually when that person becomes known, when they subscribe or, you know, you can connect that to an email they've opened, then you can get even richer personalization because you then can also personalize with the um, uh, data that you have in the database as well as their uh, last behaviors. Um, and so this has really enabled them to, you know, in fact, increase some of the intensity of what they're doing because each, each communication is far more tailored um, and relevant to the recipient. Um, and whilst also, you know, treating people in a, in a you know, meaning, meaningful way. So, I rattled through that a bit, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. And I've given also my contact details and a link to a, an interesting article um, on that um, last slide there too. So I'll see if I thanks can see so much. Um, I think I, yes. Can you see the chat? Okay. Um, thank you so much, Antonia, and I think it was really good. Um, I think the question which possibly you might want to take up a little bit is. Um, in the context of B2B, some examples of how people are using personalization, because that was a question that came up. And um, another question was a little bit on the kind of data that is useful for personalization and what are the kind of tools that someone should have in order to track that. Okay. Um, I, well, so from a B2B perspective, I think I mentioned this in the chat, there's a huge scope for B2B organizations to personalize the experience. Um, and, and I think that what we've just seen is that really from a B2B perspective, you don't see consumers voting with their feet in the same way. You know, B2B buyers tend to be, you know, in an organization that you know, moves slower and may have a previous relationship with, you know, your organization. And so I think the urgency hasn't been there, but that's changing. 
um, because you know so much product research is now done online. It's so easy to switch um, providers, but I think we're starting to see that. Um, and in terms of kind of examples of uh, you know where this is get, you know doing right, and I think that IBM has worked very hard in in terms of being able to do this. So you know you, we look at. Um, you know where you're coming onto the site, what you look at from a product perspective. You also, we also track, um, we also gate assets. So if you want to download a white paper or something like that, you would be asked for some pieces of information, um, like your email address and your first name. But then every subsequent time you come to the site and try to download something, um, you're asked for additional pieces of information. So we can build up this profile over time, and then you'd be nurtured accordingly. So we use a combination of that you know, explicit customer data that we're asking for, that customers tell us, um, plus behavioral data that we're gathering from the website, but also, you know, if you attend a webinar or other, you know, or if you attend a trade show. Um, and then we combine that and we use that to both score prospects to then route them to the right salesperson through an integration with a CRM, or and also personalize our, you know, nurture communications to try and, you know, take uh, progress um, and qualify um, those those contacts. And so I hope that answers it from a B2B question. The other question was what to track and um, what systems to use, I think. Um, well, I think, as I sort of said before, it really, you know, you need a, you need a you know, marketing automation tool that can act as a, you know, marketing database. And I, I don't advocate, you know, a whole new data warehouse. I think that's generally overkill. But you do need a database that can be used by marketing, not by IT, you know, that is useful for marketing, that contains, um, you know, marketing relevant information that you will use for both, you know, personalization and segmentation um, to sort of, you know, improve the timing and the content of your, uh, of your messages. Um, and that should also have be integrated, first of all, of, of course, um, across your digital channels, so email, mobile, um, SMS. You you want that to all be able to happen from one place, so you can all you know you can um, personalize across channels and not have additional silos, but also into your ad tech, tech space. So you know you should be able to um, connect that through to Facebook, so that you can be more targeted in your acquisition campaigns um, using lookalike audiences based on your you know real time customer data, for example. And then that you know if you're a B two B organization, you would want that integrated into your CRM. Um, so that you can, you know, map that, that you, you know, bring that back into, um, you know, sales. And you also want that integrated with, you know, the data that is is most important for you to be able to be more personalized. So for a retail company, that might be um, transactional data or travel data. It could be booking, you know, travel company, it could be booking data. Um, and then the final piece is, of course, is, is, is your, you know, web, your website. You want to be um, at, at the very least integrating with your analytics. And depending on what analytics tool you're using, the you know the better or worse the data will be. So Google Analytics, of course, you may struggle to get individual data. But your marketing tool, um, like like, like um, Watson Campaign Automation, also could tag your website so that um, you, you know when somebody abandons your page. Um, that immediately comes back into your marketing system so you can trigger a, a communication in, in near or real time. So um, that's all possible with sort of, um, you know, with, with, the, with the, um, the tools out there. So it's, a, you know, it's about consolidating your customer information and then layering on as much behavioral information. And I would argue, my last point would be that behavioral information is more important than trying to get all of your historical data in one place. What somebody is showing you today is better than what somebody did a year ago or even six months ago. Um, and, you know, what people tell you is, you know, can be, can have false positives. You know, I might say I'm interested in one thing, but in fact, if I'm coming to your website and consistently browsing something else, then it would be more relevant to me to be sent something related to what I've been browsing rather than what I told you. So um, I would say that behavioral information, real-time information is, is more interesting, more important than, than trying to connect all of your, you know, legacy systems together potentially. Great. Um, so thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, actually, Antonia, there is a question for you in the chat window, but I will let you answer that in the chat window okay. itself. And um, thanks to everyone for joining us today. It's been a great session, very interactive. 
Um, I think it says something that we're still answering the question and it's four o'clock. So um, thank you once again. And we will be mailing everybody the recording. It will be available also on our site. So thanks for joining us and thanks so much to IBM as well for co-hosting this with us. Uh, we will keep the chat window open for another 10 minutes in case people want to continue the conversation.